Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 659 with Chef Matt Selby. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef Matt Selby. My man, Matt, are you feeling unstoppable today? Yes and no. I mean, yeah, yeah. Here we are sitting here. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty unstoppable. Nice. I love it. So originating from Denver's Five Points community, Matt Selby got his start in the restaurant industry at the once popular Rattlesnake Grill. His skills in the kitchen and ability to lead others quickly rec- were, were quickly recognized by those in the industry, and it was clear that opportunities were inevitable. Those opportunities came in 1997 when Selby was approached by Josh Wolkin. Am I saying that correctly? Josh Walkon, yeah. Walkon to join the event. Vesta and a secret sauce restaurant. Sorry, to join Vesta, a, a secret sauce restaurant concept. Selby parted ways with Secret Sauce in 2013 and has been earning a living, a living as a consultant, opening restaurants, overseeing multiple locations as a culinary director, and occasionally serving as a line cook. He's recognized as being key in the. Uh, contribution to Denver's Culinary Foundation, not only for his skills in the kitchen, but also, and more importantly, in my opinion, for his patience and passion to serve as a mentor to the next generation of professionals. I cannot wait to get into this, the story, your story, uh, your knowledge, but let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quarter mantra. What do you got for us? Um, I guess I have two. Um, kindness. Kindness is everything. If, if you can't be kind, get out kindness is everything if you can't get, be kind get out why does that resonate with you why did you choose that i i i, I don't know i mean it just makes sense <laughs> it's true, think about right? it i mean yeah. yeah being kind is everything and if it, 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 and and, and it, there's a difference between kind and professional and and when you you have to tie them together at some point um being kind and being professional you know sometimes it, th- those lines get blurred um but at the end of the day, you need to find a way to be kind to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody. I think that's, that's good enough. We don't have to go any deeper, man. I think you made <laughs> your point. And where does it make sense to start telling your story? Um, when did you really like start to get into the industry? When did you know this is something that you might be doing for a while? I mean, I, I, as a young kid, my, my mom would cook at home. And, and I think that's when I fell in love with cooking. Um, but... It's one thing to fall in love with cooking. It's another thing to fall in love with the industry. And I don't know that if, if I've fallen in love with the industry, it's only been over the past couple of years. I really? had to do it on my own terms. I can't wait to find out when you discovered that you were. I don't want to jump right there yet. <laughs> yeah, like no, let's not get there it's yet. It's more recent, and I want to kind of get there chronologically. Um, but from my research, it sounds like you really broke into the industry in 1995, going back 24 years ago um, at the Rattlesnake. 24 Road. years. Yeah, crazy to say, right? Um, 1995, what brought you to this opportunity? Single-parent mom. Um, me and my brother were just trying to get by. Um, both of us dropped out of high school. But at the time when we dropped out of high school, we were cooking. We knew that we could cook. We knew that the job was important because it paid the bills. Um, and that, that, was, that was just one thing. We, we knew that we could cook. But when we were cooking at that age, we didn't know that we were cooking. It was just a job. My brother went into sushi and... Like he fell in love with raw fish and and rice done the proper you, way. You did a, little, a short stint at this at a sushi place, didn't you? Like I in did. Between? Yeah, I, yeah. Well, and, and they were the same place. Yeah, they okay. wouldn't let me roll sushi. They wanted me to be the executive chef, and um, I didn't want to be the executive chef of a sushi restaurant because I, I, I tried. I really did, and I'd look out into the dining room, and everybody's eating sushi, but nobody's eating the kitchen food, the executive chef food. I was bored. Um, yeah. and all I wanted to do was roll sushi, just like my brother. Okay, that, so that came. That was after um the Rattlesnake Grill. Um, oh no, that was before. That was before Rattlesnake Grill. Yeah. Okay. So what brought you to the Rattlesnake Grill? Why did you? So you left sushi because you just didn't like it? I I I, I needed a job. Okay. And my, and my roommate knew that they were hiring, and he knew that I could maybe cook. I thought I could. <laughs> um. And so he, he, he suggested that I come in and talk with the executive chef and just get and, and, and I was miserable where I was cooking. Big corporate chain. Um, no, no need to say names. They're not even around anymore. Um, so w- w- let me I'm uh, not really sure where the timeline starts. 1995 is when you were at Rattlesnake, but you were cooking well before that. Oh, so yeah. What year? Like, when was it when you got into the industry? 
Like 90? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of you were sharpening the, the blade well before 1995. I didn't you know I was, but yeah, yeah I guess okay. I was. So any key experiences, any key mentors, any key lessons to take before Rattlesnake that are worth diving into? I, I, I mean, there's a lot to be said for learning what you don't want to do and from what other people's do that just simply aren't right. You kind of hinted towards that when like the corporate uh, setting that did something about that didn't resonate with you. What was it exactly? The p- Maybe it was a particular person <laughs> acting a certain way. We won't have to say names. Or maybe it was the culture in general. What was going on exactly? Look at me, man. I can't work no <laughs> corporate job. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and I think that there's a lot to be said for that's the restaurant business like it, 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 it you got two ways to go you can do that 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 like independent march to your own beat or yeah you can go go corporate and learn a, and earn a lot of money perhaps yeah so they say um but at the end of the day much with anything that you do it really comes down to like what is that what is that that beat that you march to yeah is it corporate or is it individual it took me a long time to figure that out so at this point it sounds like you didn't quite realize that this wasn't the beat um you didn't you knew this was the beat you didn't want to march to, right? But you didn't quite know what you wanted to do yet at this point. But can you, knowing what you know now, knowing who you are now, reflecting back at this time, what was going on in that environment that just didn't sit right with you? Waste, 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 waste um, of souls and, and resources all around in, in, in our restaurant business. What do you mean waste of souls? How do you waste a soul? When you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week as an executive chef, as a sous chef, as a manager, as a general manager, as a server doing double shifts, busting asses, your soul is wasted. Mm. And you get into the business with so many exciting goals that, that and listen, I know it's, it's, you, 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 it, it's convenient to have morals after the fact, but when those goals are in front of you and, 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 Maybe you won't attain them. And what have you done after the fact? All you've done is hustle. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it, it, yeah, wasteful of souls and, and wasteful of resources. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, you, you look at the way, th- th- there's no balance. There's absolutely no balance. Ba- I'm not here to, like, badmouth the restaurant business. But I think that that's what I'm trying to do with my business. But, you know, at the same time, like, obviously I love the industry. Like, I've dedicated my life to serving the industry. You have dedicated your life to service to the industry. Mm -hmm. We love the industry, but let's be honest, like, the industry isn't that great. I mean, there's a lot of things we could be doing better. And that's what we're here to do is to share the knowledge and make it better. So, um, taking from my research, uh, it it seemed like things really started to kind of, like, take off for you around 97 when you were approached by Josh. Uh, What was going on in your life? Paint the picture of who you became up to this point, you were getting a lot of recognition. Was it the work that you were doing at Rattlesnake that kind of garnered that recognition? I, I think that at, at Rattlesnake, I mean, I mean, it, you know, it, as a young line cook at Rattlesnake, it's not, not like people were, you don't get talked about in the press, but people talk about you in the industry. Yeah. What were people saying about you at this time? The kid hustles and the kid, the kid busts ass and the kid, like, genuinely loves I loved what I did and I always have and I love the industry can save you and and I loved that about yeah. it I mean just to like kind of give perspective to the listeners it was 95 when you joined the Rattlesnake Grill mm-hmm. um, and it was 2000 sorry 1997 two years later so you came into Rattlesnake um, as a line cook right yeah with zero zero like true experience my, my experience before Rattlesnake was open bag Pour into steam well, add milk. That's how you make a soup. And then two years later, you're approached by Josh, who's looking to make you an executive chef. What was that conversation? Was it a, was that the role, or were you going in as a line, like a? Well, a I went into I went into chef? Vesta with Josh as, as his sous chef. The sous chef. Yeah. So I mean, that's two years. That's a pretty decent jump with no prior experience, right? That that's the picture I'm trying to form for the passion list. is everything. So and, and 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 hustle is everything. When you fall in love with like what you're you know you're gonna do for the rest of your life for better or worse you go after it what does hustle look like get specific paint that picture of what your life looked like and how you were showing up every day like let's try to replicate this wake up 5 a.m every morning i'm at starbucks reading cookbooks um learning as much as i pot asking questions picking up shifts taking on charity events taking on anything that would like let me touch food and let me be connected to other people whether it was a a guest or 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 a fellow cook or just anything in the community i mean 
it, you get obsessed with it, you yeah. know? So was this something that you were, was there a conversation where you were having with yourself to, 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 to continue to show up? Or was it something that you wanted and there really wasn't any conversation that you had to have? Because yeah, you there's no it. conversation. Yeah. You just do it. You That's just awesome. do it. When you fall in love with something, you just do it. You just go after it with all of your, yeah. all of your, like everything that you have. I love it. You just go after it. Was there one person at Rattlesnake that really had an impact on who you are today? Keith Josephak and John Trejo. The, they, they were the chef and the sous chef. And they gave me my first cookbooks. They, they, and Frank Bonanno, Frank Bonanno, um, another, you know, uh, I, I was about to say another local celebrity chef, but no, he is, he is a local celebrity <laughs> chef. Um, I had Frank on the show. I'm so embarrassed because his last name was giving me so much trouble. I was like, I couldn't spit out his last name. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I bet that pissed him. I'm sorry, Frank. I'm I didn't sh- say that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did piss him off. I struggled with last name. Um, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your story. No, that's all right. Um, interrupt all you want, man. This is your show. Shit. Oh man. This is your show for the next hour. Pardon my language. I just said a bad word. I'm There's sorry. Far worse things that have been said on the show by Fair myself. Enough. So don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but like those three people, Frank, John and Keith, um, and, and, you know, Frank, Frank's second day at the rattlesnake grill was my first day. He was there on an internship. So between, you know, a line cook who was about to become big, a sous chef and, a, and an executive chef that, that gave me cookbooks and, and it, it took me in, you know? So I paint the picture of not necessarily what these people were doing, but who these people were and how who they were influenced you. I, I, I don't I don't know how they inf- I didn't know at the time when I showed up for my for, for my interview at the Rattlesnake Grill and and Keith was wearing a, a chef coat. I'm like, why is this guy wearing a karate uniform? <laughs> why? You know, this is I didn't I didn't know. I didn't know. How did they All react I to knew is say what? How did they react to that? I didn't say that, oh. but that's what I was thinking. Like, but uh. but that goes to to like. I didn't know what I was getting into. I just knew that my roommate knew I could cook or be a good restaurant employee. They were hiring. And they took me on. But I mean, what I'm pulling from this part of your life, this part of your story, is that they weren't just your bosses. They they were investing in you. They were giving you resources. They wanted they wanted to see you grow. And I think that's kind of what I wanted to pull is that they they they, they, they it wasn't just a transaction for them. They were making no. you into a better person. Yes, they paved the way. They they and they anything that I do in my career now comes from them. Like you share, you you nurture, you train. You reach out um, and you take people places. And that was like, again, okay, so back to your timeline. By, by 1995 and a half, uh, they, were, they, they took me to New York to do City Meals on Wheels, a giant chef, celebrity chef, um, charity event. And, and like off the plane, we're meeting Emeril, we're meeting Alice Waters. Wow. But more importantly, they took me to do a charity event. Like, I busted ass for them, and they reciprocated. But in, 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 in doing so, they taught me a lesson. Like, if you're going to go somewhere, if, if, if you're going to make it anyway, you, you take the people that, that, that brought you there. You take yes. the people that mean the most. Yes, man, I'm loving it. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's if – it's we're pulling some great lessons from this part of your life. Does it make sense to transition to the next part of your life, or is there any other lesson, any other – thing that came from these early days in your career we're back and um we're just about to get into uh josh approaching you i don't know how it all went down but it sounds like he approached you to come join his team what we take us to that moment when this conversation or did he go interview like what was it like what was i i I, like i said my roommate well my roommate interviewed for a general manager position at vesta with josh okay and uh, he said, hey, man, you know, go, go talk to Josh. So I went and talked to Josh. And that's when I learned a job interview and a job interview. A job interview ought to be a conversation. Yeah. We talked for an hour and a half, maybe two hours. What did the conversation look like? What were we talking about? What's the coolest thing you've ever done with food? What's the coolest experience you've ever had with wine? How how do you contact and, and reach and touch a guest? And how do you get them coming back for more? And like, what is your vision on hospital? Like, hospitality. It, it turned into like I said, it it, it, it was a conversation. Do you what? know 
that conversation? Do you remember that conversation when you were talking about what hospitality is? Do you remember what you said? Do you remember what that looked like? What that be- no? Because I was? feel like I feel like my my what I thought it what what I thought I knew of hospital. I, I didn't know anything about hospitality back then. What do you ref- reflecting back at the time, trying to put yourself in that position? What did you think it was then? Being consistent. Giving, giving, giving guests the same thing over and over, what they want, giving value, value. I mean, I, even from a young age, I, I value means everything. Mm. If, if, if you make the choice to come to my restaurant with your hard earned money, that privilege. means the world to me. Yeah. And, and I'm going to give it back mm. one way or the other. Is this what you said to him or is, or is this something that you learned later on? No, I knew it, but I don't know that I said it. I think that I, I, I may have been. I, I feel like I said it in, in, in different words, but over the, over the years, what I just said has been a mantra, I guess. Like, if you choose to spend your money with me, I'm going to give it back. So what is your definition of hospitality now? Now that, you know, 24 years later, 23 years later, what's your different? What's, what's that? How has that changed? How has that transformed? It... it, it it's just a tough question. There, well, there's some lines that are blurred with that, you know, yeah. and, and, I'm, and I'll tell you what I'm having the hardest time with is like, what's the difference between a customer and a guest? And, and, and when when you're in the business, especially from a, like the, the, the corporate side, they drive into your head. They're, they're not customers. They're guests. They're not customers. No, God damn it. They are customers, because if you're a guest at my house, I might burn something and we can laugh it off. But when you're a customer paying hard earned money. You're not a guest anymore. Yeah. You are paying money. That makes you a customer. Your, your guests don't write Yelp reviews. No. When they come into your No. Room. I was hanging out with Bobby and, um, you know. He was in a bad mood. He overcooked my duck. And, yeah. You know? So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. I'm picking it up. But uh, um, So, let's dive into this. This, uh, this is like your first, like, real leadership position, correct? Is it safe to say when joining uh, Besta? Yeah. So, what was that like, that transition into a leadership role? <sighs> Rough. Rough. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's certainly I didn't have years of, of sous chef, executive chef or any sort of management experience. Couple that with opening a restaurant. Opening a restaurant is tough. So you, know? you joined Vesta when they were opening. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Reflect back at that time. What was, so, what was going on? Paint the picture for us. I don't know. It happened so fast. <laughs> I mean, you know, and that you... I've learned that whether it's your first restaurant open or your 10th, 11th, or 12th, the same things come up. You get tested. You're, you're te- like, can I do this? Is this what I want? Am I sure about this? Um, so what's getting tested? Like your, your will, your skill? Like everything. Yeah. Everything. You're, you're, can you stay awake? Yeah. <laughs> can, can, you know, can you, you know, back then it was, do I, do, do, will I find time with my friends now? It's like, when will I see my kids? Right. Um, everything gets it gets tested. Your your patience, your leadership, um, and all you need, all you all you can do is you get to the end of it, and, and you, you you realize what you're made of. You you realize also what your your flaws are, and and what to work on. You go into the next project thinking okay i made a whole bunch of mistakes and so what were you made of let's get into it like you were it sounds like you're figuring yourself out at this point this is really where you, you mean you're you knew you had chops you knew you could cook but now you're really figuring yourself out. i had to learn how to be a manager okay so what did that look like how did you learn did you have to learn the hard way oh yeah i pissed people off i i hurt people what I'd, kind of manager were you before i was a tongue throwing asshole i was i was a i was a temper tantrum like i and and I, I don't think that I thought that that's what chefs were supposed to be. Again, I, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't experienced enough to know, like, how chefs should act. So I, I don't feel like I got caught up in that prima donna as much as I didn't know how to control myself. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. I was twenty. <laughs> you don't know what you do. Two know. years old. Until you know. Until you figure it out. And you learn it the hard way. You yeah. On your face, right? Yeah. And you, you and you get thrust into a chef position, big business. And you have no idea what you're doing. So what, I mean, it sounds like you're figuring yourself out. It sounds like you learned the hard way that you can't be an asshole in the yeah. kitchen. Um, was there a, a, a turning point? Was there a pivotal point where you kind of woke up and you said, and you changed your approach to leadership and you changed your approach to management? Or managing? I feel like I learned that, 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 that there's a giant, giant difference between commanding and demanding respect. Giant difference between commanding and demanding respect. 
commanding and demanding? What are the differences? I would see other chefs. I would see other, whether it was in our company or, or otherwise, walk into a room and expect respect, you know, demanding respect. And then I would see others just come in and, and say the right things and show the right things, be patient, be kind, and like, like celebrate victories and teach on failures. To me, that, that's commanding respect. Like just, I'm calm, I'm cool, I'm gonna teach something. Yeah, I kind of think of like the word that's coming into my mouth or my mind is is um, earning it, right? Yeah, you, yeah. You can't just com- d- demand it. You've got to earn it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not gonna. I don't know you. I don't know what kind of boss you're gonna be. I'm, you got to earn my respect. You got to earn. You got to earn that. You have to connect with people, mm-hmm. and 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 that 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 that's every day. That ain't got nothing to do with the industry. Mm-hmm. If, if they're meaningful to you, you have to connect and you have to find a way to connect. You have to try. How do you find ways to connect? How do you try to connect? Personal stories? Like, I don't know. I, I look for things. I, I, I look Take for... Take an interest. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's important to me. But, but on the other hand, and this is the beautiful thing about the consulting side is if I don't take an interest, I ain't going to. If you don't take an interest, you're not going to. No. If, if if I don't see if I don't see a personal connection in the industry in 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 life, no, I'm not. I'm not going to take. I'm not going to. You won't take the job. So I'm not, well, I'm not going to go after it. I'm not going. I'm not going to go after that relationship. Why is that? There's so many more out there that they are that, 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 that are they're beautiful. <laughs> they haven't demanded your respect. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and and. Or I guess uh, commanded your respect. I think that the there's a difference between. Th- th- I think it has more to do with the difference between being a consultant and being an employee, whether it's a cul- culinary director, executive chef, or whatever, or whatever. Um, if whether or not I see your talent as an employee of a big company, I I have to do my best to get that out of you. As a consultant, if I don't see it, ain't worth my time. Yeah, I'm gonna go put that time into something that is so much more valuable. I'm really interested in the consulting side of things. Like I, I made a, a note to make sure we talked about why consulting wasn't for you, and I want to come back to that. Um, well, no, consulting is for me. I'm, I'm trying to make a living at this, man. At one point, <laughs> did you say that you, you didn't like consulting? That, that like the when I tried to get away from like the day to day chef restaurateur business, I went after consulting. And I hated it at first, but I, I think I went into it all wrong. And I, and I, I let's revisit this because I feel this comes on later <laughs> on. I think we're, we we will dissect that because I think there probably are a lot of people listening to this who are good at what they do, and they're wondering, you know, they develop this asset, this knowledge, this skill. I mean, some people go into building restaurants, other people go into helping other people build restaurants. Yeah. So uh, it's something I definitely want to explore, but I want to unpackage um, how you evolved as a professional with the Secret Sauce Restaurant Group, and um, I, I'm just gonna like pass it to you now, like. In this, oh, you were there for 13 years, right? A, a good more. Month, more. I mean, from 97. 15, I'm trying yeah, to think of the timeline. Years, yeah. 15 years. So w- take us through the evolution of who you were, of, of the business. of like I really just want to get an idea of like what this journey was like. I mean, I, the, the, the big perspective is this. I mean, that that's like I said earlier, that's part one of my career. I'm on to part two of my career now. So um, part one was working in the industry. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and. You know, ground lo- ground level executive chef. When we opened Vesta, that that was the baby. Nine years later, we opened Steubens, and then after that, we opened Ace. You know, I don't. We we always talked about being multi concept and um, all these big plans. And but I, it, it, the, the Vesta the Vesta was just it was everything to me. It was how I learned to be a professional. Um, how I learned about myself and, and, and how I learned about people. I, I don't know. I mean, b- b- but it also, and it's not just Vesta. It was the business. It also destroyed me. It also beat me up. It also, I don't know. How did it destroy you? Get into it. I get into, <laughs> I, I don't ask these question, man. I want to learn from your life. I, with, with, the, the industry finds a way of beating you up. And you get caught up in it. What I didn't realize at the time is that, that, that the industry in my life were very much s- similar, parallel. Um, and that to like be really good in one means being really good in the other. And, you know, like I said, 22, 23, when, when we opened Vesta, 
Ain't nobody gave me the tools to be a successful chef, to, to get your name in the paper, or just be a good goddamn manager. You know what I mean? Or be a good businessman. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. And so it kind of creeps up with you. Um, unfortunately, business is, you know, sales solves everything. It was, we were busy. We didn't, yeah. Things find a way of taking care of themselves. I feel like I'm, I might be missing something. Was there like a, <laughs> like, like you said like the, the industry kind of like gobbled you up. Like what, what would you have done now knowing what you knew now? I would have been way more real with myself. I would have How? known who I was, but I didn't. You get into the business because the, this business attracts losers like me. And you, you, you put a bunch of people in a kitchen that are just trying to figure out their lives and all of a sudden they're good at something. That's pretty special. And how do you maintain For that? For the record, from what I've read online and from what people have said about you in the city, far from a loser, uh, for cl- I think that's clear of what you've been able to, the respect you've been able to garner for for sure. But, I mean, what if, if, if imagine I'm a chef. I'm not a chef. Mm-hmm. I have too much respect for the, the I'm not even uh, barely a cook, right? Um, say I was a chef, though, and I'm talking mm-hmm. to you, and, I, and I'm worried about getting gobbled up by the industry, right? What, what advice would you give me to prevent somebody else from, from falling into the same trap that you fell into? Fall in love with, with it for the right reasons and be true to yourself. I what mean, are the right reasons? Hospitality. Um, making a business. Creating a business. Creating something that, that, that thrives in the community above and beyond itself. It has nothing to do with yourself. It has nothing to do with, with ego. It has nothing to do with sending it in. There, there ain't no party every night. And I feel like that's, you know. So what was happening? So you, you painted the picture of what you should get into the industry for or, or, and what you what advice you would give somebody who was getting into or you, what advice you would give them to protect them from getting into that trap. What were you doing? Now, now tell us what you actually did and what things you were focused on that, that sucked you into the trap. I was focused on myself. I was focused on being a, a big name chef. You know, I didn't, I didn't know anything about celebrity chefs when I got into the business, but all of a sudden some some dumbass kid from five points gets his name in his paper yeah man that's kind of cool that's kind of yeah, rad yeah and and so yeah you, you it t- my career took a bit of a detour in a lot of ways you know you, you lose focus of the importance of the community and good food and you were doing what was best for you and not best for everybody else absolutely okay. i couldn't have said that any better okay and how long did that go before you woke up well, 2013. You know, I mean, I, I feel like when I was coming to terms with leaving Vesta, leaving the company, that's that's kind of that, that was like the beginning of. Now's a really good time to figure out who you are professionally and yeah. personally, yeah. and they're so interconnected, mm. so interconnected. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it at the time. Well, I say it all the time. I mean, I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in your life's work, and if you you know, and if, if you make it your life's work, then you don't need the. I mean. You gotta, you gotta find. I'm not saying like you don't make time for your family and all. I get that part of it, but I'm saying when, when it's your life's work, mm-hmm. then the balance no creates line. itself. There's no line because it's just, yeah. it's just why you exist, right? And finding your purpose. But then you throw things in like kids, yeah, and, and, I, I, and you know, I, easy for me to say. I'm I've single, got three daughters, over. so yeah. you know, and that you know, like I hear you bringing bringing kids into this world, and this industry. You know, like. Two of my oldest daughters are both in industry. You know, okay. one one's a bartender, one's a server, and I joke that I wanted so much more for them, despite the fact that I I love watching them work, work so hard, and I love the path that they're on. It's very much the same path, but they're a hell of a lot more in tune with themselves than I am when I was their age. Yeah. Um, I don't know where were we going with that. I just no. I, I love <laughs> I love to see my kids happy in the industry, no, but there's it. a point of like. It's the industry. No, ma'am. I think the same thing happened with me and my parents. Like I, when I was growing up in my teens, working in the restaurant, my early teens. And my Did you think that like you were going to be in the restaurant industry oh, yeah. for like the rest I, of your I had, life? I always, I made it a point to say like I wanted to open my own restaurant. My parents would say, no, we're working so hard so you don't have <laughs> to, you know, like go become a commercial pilot. I did that and. Lot, Which I think is awesome. That story. <laughs> you were a commercial pilot. Yeah, well, you're not flipping the table on me right now, are you? No, I just want to know more about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm horrified of flying. I want to know how somebody... Yeah can do that on their own that's rad and plenty of training man uh i don't <laughs> i couldn't i feel like i couldn't lead a kitchen the way some of these folks do so i mean fair the enough. right training and the right uh knowledge anybody can do anything but back to your story okay. um 
I, I'm really curious. Um, was there like a catalyst or like a tipping point or an event that kind of sent you on this new trajectory of trying to figure out who you were and trying to find this this balance? Is, I mean, uh, both personally and professionally. You know, personally, um, I had to come to terms with a lot of things in my life that were holding me back. One of them was like come to terms with my bisexuality. I've been married for so long and I've got three beautiful daughters and I was living this false life. Um, and that carried over into my professional life. Mm. Um, I needed to come to terms professionally. This business don't owe me nothing regardless of the victories and the failures that I've had. Um, I guess the trajectory I'm on is it's time to work hard again. It's time to prove myself all over again. Um, but it's also time to do it on my own terms. Mm -hmm. So somebody who might be having this conversation um, with getting clarity with themselves, being true to themselves, what advice do you have? Well, that's the thing. And that's it, it, all of these things, like your personal, and, uh, they can happen in any industry. But w w yeah, man, when you're working so much and there's absolutely balance and, and you don't know a thing about yourself it's impossible to, to to create that and and that's where i'm at like how do we turn the business into something that gives back to the people that give so much i don't know the answer to that but that's what i carry into my in, into into consulting you know what was the question where, where were no, we going basically um like this 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 coming to light basically like you kind of getting clarity on who you are and how who you are completely parallels your professional life and your professional happiness um but i feel like there's probably a lot of people that might be trying to figure out exactly what it is what path they want to get on and what what trajectory they want to be on and they might be having this debate this inner debate with themselves so figured out together they're 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 while while you're work just like you said work and 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 like like personal and professional in a perfect world, they're, they're already joined. And, and creating balance, it are, it, it's already built in. Um, and, and until you can reach that, like, that rhythm, that, that, that jive, you better be damn sure that this is really, really, really what you want to do. And you better know who you are. I think of the, the most successful restaurateurs. One common thing is that they, they, they've got confidence in who they are and, and how they got here or they're crazy enough to, to like be above that and, 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 and just keep going um, I don't think the confidence is huge but but like knowing who you are that's huge so you choose to um, resign or leave the uh, secret sauce restaurant group 2013 or 2012 um, what's going on in your mind like what's what are you trying to figure out what what are you, is there any strategy to the, the decisions you're making? No, or? no. In <laughs> retrospect, it was, it was. Listen, I'm too good. I'm, I'm really good at two things, like self destruction and hospitality, <laughs> and 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 leaving that that was very much a self destructive part of my career of like, fuck it all. So you, you're saying that when you left, that was a self destructive part. Oh of your yeah. Career. Why is that? Too young and stupid to, to, to figure out what I, I really wanted and needed and couldn't find the words. Or I think maybe seeing what you might have had. I mean, you were kind of sitting in a good spot with a, a, group, a restaurant group that was doing good if, things. If I could take it all back, man, I would, I would go back for that culinary director position in a heartbeat. Like, multi-concept, restaurants that I adore, food that I, 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 I love. Um, this is the secret sauce of yeah, restaurant group we're talking you know, about. What, what would the conversation look like if you could go back and have that conversation <laughs> with yourself? What, would you, like, what are the words you'd tell yourself back then? No. Shut up and I'm sorry. I got <laughs> I'm a pain in the ass, man. I, I pull back the layers. I try to really try to. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, and I'm trying to be as honest as I can. Like, I, don't, I don't have the answers, you yeah, know? Yeah, I hear you. I'm trying to, and, and these are like the daily conversations that I have with myself of like, okay, this is really how you screwed it up the first time around. This is what you really ought to be thinking about this second time around. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a, a much better idea of who you are today and like what, to what your so. strengths are today. And you you seem like just much more clarity. Um, it sounds like uh, honest. That. I'm, I'm, I, there's no clarity. I'm, I'm honest. So I'm honest with myself and I'm honest with, with, with who I am, what I can deliver and what I can't. So being honest with yourself and us, what is it that you bring to this industry? What is it that you do exceptionally well? Leadership. Okay. Leadership. So 
take us there. What's good leadership look like? What does what when you're co consulting somebody and teaching them about leadership? What does that What does that conversation look like? You don't. You, again, it's the same thing of, of demanding and commanding respect. You can't teach it. You can't go about saying, "This is how I'm going to teach leadership." You have it, and I hate to. Well, I was about to say you have it or you don't. I hate to say that. It's true, though. I think maybe some, it is. I don't know. Well, you know, I think leadership can be taught, but I do think some people are instinctually, socially, and emotionally intelligent, and they can, you know, they know how to demand or com sorry command <laughs> respect naturally because they respect other people and they can read body language and they they know when they've crossed lines without anybody saying anything right and, and what you just said i think is huge that you can read body language and that you're observant enough to know that person's having a really fucked up day and maybe i should dig down a little deeper to find out what's going on and not and i think that that's the difference between first part of my career and the second part of my career I ain't digging down deep to, to get more out of them. I'm digging down deep because... You care. Yeah, man. I, 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 I used to have such a hard time with like people calling in sick and me calling in sick and people... like, And how we are as an industry of that calling in sick. There needs to be some balance with mental health and physical health in this industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to make right the second time around. Yeah. Um, but, but, but again, like digging down deep d d because you care and not because you're trying to get something out of them. I don't know. Does that? No, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, one other thing I think I, I would love to kind of get into with you and your story, um, or just you and what's going on now, like you, you seem to be a, um, an advocate for change in the industry. Um, it seems to be something that I'm picking up a lot when I'm reading on you. What exactly is the change? You're talking about uh, personal health. You're talking about everything. Uh, everything. Like well, like I said earlier, I mean, th this this industry wastes souls and resources. Mm -hmm. That needs to stop. You so know, what needs to change? How can I we don't start? have the answers yeah. on that, but I know that as a consultant, and I know as a, as a, as an employed culinary director, if I see the waste, I point it out. So if I uh, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, like, what are you doing personally to be that change? Everything I can. You know. You said you said it's when you see something, if you see waste, you point it out. When I see potential for, for somebody's soul to be wasted because of the other, the, the, the third double shift in a row, like, that's the time to say, no, I'm, I'll, I'll do it. Like, I'll work it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'm looking at is uh, if, if, we, if we agree with what you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, if we're like, yeah, there needs to be change, how do we replicate the things that you're doing to contribute to I don't change? know. I don't know the answer to that, but I feel like when I do, that's when it becomes a business, and that's when it becomes a bigger, larger mantra for the industry. And I hope that, I, I hope that other people – I know that other people see that. I just don't have the answer. Maybe, maybe it's – Okay, so you, as as a, as a restaurant firm, you've you've reached this many um, units. Now might be a good time to start offering really solid health and health health insurance that that includes mental, dental, vision, um, those types of things. Um, on the food side of it, the, the 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 resources side of it, that's daily. I th th and that that's just calling things out. You. Again, I don't have the answer on how you. I be think it's creating a culture of calling things out. Yeah, you have uh, to call it out. Yeah, like when you when you see shit that's not right. Mm -hmm. When you when you're, you know, hitting a wall. When you're emotionally in the shitter, mm -hmm. you know, call it out. Yeah, and create a culture where it's okay to to call out the the, sh the bullshit, right? And I, but you have to let it be known that it's okay to point out what's not okay. I think I think you're then then yeah then what you're saying is 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 exactly what it is, and that's a giant shift. In, yeah. you know, it, 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 like think of a manager meeting where you're going around the table and like, oh, this person called in sick for this reason and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, that person called in sick because they were goddamn sick. Yeah. And we need to let that happen. You know, and if, they, and if they're calling in sick because of another reason, then why is it a situation that they have to to do that? Like, you know, like what? Like maybe they're calling in sick because we're not as good of a restaurant group that we thought we were. Yeah, exactly. Like, I guess the question is, you got to kind of like turn it around sometimes yes yeah, you know? there's a reason yeah so we haven't really gotten into it and i wanted to get into it you you had mentioned when you first kind of took this pivot away from working in the industry to working on the industry as a consultant and, and teaching people and educating people and consulting people um at first it wasn't what you expected what were what kind of blind side blind blind sided you about being a consultant the first time around that made you hate it 
the first being, time being a salesman, like selling myself. Yeah, I get that, man. Uh, right? I mean, yeah. you, I'm sure you have to do that. I have to do it too. Yeah, like, I, and I hate it. And I'd rather it just sucks. let my work. I'd rather just let my work. I just want to get to work. I just yeah, want to exactly. get to work. I get that. So, so what was? Why was it so bad that it, it drew that pushed you away temporarily from consulting? I like let's. It, it's what I'd have to sell myself as a consultant, and then yeah. and then you know, um, well, I, the, the, the giant part is, is putting food on the table, mm-hmm. you know, g- getting bills paid on time, and, and stringing enough projects together um, to to feed it, three hungry daughters. It takes you know, it takes years, if not five or six years, I, to, I, to, rep, to, to build a reputation, to build a business. Yeah, you know, not not a yeah. reputation. I feel like there was enough reputation going in, but not enough to build the business, and and I feel like again being naive and thinking i can do anything i want because i've got this reputation that that i've built in my hometown um you you still have to build the business and i just wasn't ready for it i wasn't i I, it wasn't the the timing wasn't right yeah and i can't say that the timing is right now but it might be better (laughs) yeah so this is like 2013 where you're you're 2012 you're, you're going out you're building you're trying to build your consulting business. Uh, you did that for I'm not sure how long, but then you did a few short stints at Central Bistro, Punchbowl Social. That's why I'm here because our right? boy Robert said he got to get him on the show. Um, Which thank you, RT man, thank you. <laughs> so anything um, reflecting back at this point of your career, I feel like you're kind of evolving as a professional. You're getting back into working in the industry. What were you doing differently this time around? Um, kind of, with, you had some time away to clear your mind to to, to get. That. Well, no, I mean it all happened so fast. You know, yeah. the, the consulting was rough and I, I needed I needed to, to pay the bills I needed to, I needed I needed money yep. you know I need to take care of business so what was it like you I mean you were with this restaurant group for 15 years like it's all you know right and then you leave that's when you learn that certain systems just don't work out what systems don't work out such pain when, when <laughs> <laughs> and listen I'm not I, Punchbowl Social and I did not work out Why and that, that has nothing to do with RT and his business as much as they run their business their way I run myself my way yeah um, and it's like I don't know it's like it's like when, when you know the Cy Young winner goes and gets traded he became a Cy Young winner for, for, for a reason we put him in a new system and maybe it doesn't work out. Yeah. And everybody wants to know why he screwed up and why he ain't pitching so good. It's a different system that he's not used to. And, and it's a different system that, 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 that they weren't expecting. Mm-hmm. I learned that I, that was the beginning of learning. I, I absolutely need to march to my own. I, I need to do this on, in my, in my way, on, in my terms. I didn't know it at the time. You know, I fought it. Um, took on that position at, at Punchbowl. I did take on some other positions that were awesome and, and exciting. Um, but learning how to speak up for yourself and, and how to respect what they're trying to do. Like, maybe our goals don't align, but they, they, they need to be free to do what they're doing. And I need to be free to do what I want to do. I think it takes a lot of maturity and just emotional uh, clarity to, to have, like, to have that conversation with yourself, especially afterwards. Took me well afterwards. Yeah, I, I wish I would have had the. I, I wish that I, I would have been mature enough to have the conversation with myself at the time. So reflecting back, that I think the big lessons that I'm pulling that you wish you would have done differently would have been able to commu- maybe communicate a little bit better as far as what you wanted. Maybe you weren't communicating what you needed and wanted. Yeah. And then um, maybe also being more open-minded to maybe my way isn't the best way. Absolutely. It, t- it takes you to tango. Yeah. It, it, through the interview process, I should have said more about I need to listen to, to David Lee Roth, Van Halen at 2 o'clock every day. <laughs> I hate wearing chef coats these days. Um, and 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 they they should have said and I'm and again I'm not throwing stones at anybody. This goes for any big business that I've worked for. They should have also said mm, he, he's kind of a different bird and and yeah. maybe he doesn't fit in. Yeah. Well, I mean that's a huge I mean, moving away from your specific situation and going to a more broad general. Uh, situation when you're building your team that's a that's a conversation you have to have like what are our core values what yep. are what are we and is, does this push person fit into our culture exactly um, and that sounds like there's a little bit of a culture mismatch maybe oh and i, and I think that that's also par for the course in the, in the industry right yeah. now it's so hard to hire it's so hard to find really really good people um whether it's on an like a, like a, a 
a, a big level corporate regional level or just trying to find good prep cooks you find yourself hustling to to, to hire yeah uh, and you just do what you got to do yeah so i also saw that you had <laughs> This is another situation where you, you, you it sounded like you, you found the right home, right? In, t- in 2017 with um with Brenham or Bre- Bremen. I don't know why I'm struggling with saying this. Bremen's Say, I, Bremen. Brennan's or Brennan's? Bremen's, yeah. Bremen's. And I you. wouldn't I mean I, I found more of a of a of a home with Central Bistro. Okay. Pre- previous to that. And I think that Bremen's it was an exciting opportunity um to well, let's put that on the back burner yeah, for all now. Right. Because you said you found more of a home at Central B- uh, Central Bistro, right? Yep. Yeah. So um, what was it about Central Bistro? This was... Um, Central Bistro was like learning that I can be a leader outside of Secret Sauce. Um, How did you learn that? Just by being myself. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time, you know? Um, Why wouldn't you have been able to be a leader outside of Secret Sauce? Big giant company versus little old me, like yeah. taught me everything I knew and gave me everything that I ever things I never even knew that I wanted. I, I didn't. I didn't know. I, I had no idea that that this career, that this business, could bring me the things that it's brought me. And when it when it happens, and then you foolishly chuck it all behind, you kind of got to learn about yourself and 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 like. Yeah, I, I I had to. It sounds horrible, but I, I had to throw it away to to. You know, you got to lose what you have to realize yeah. what you have. Yeah, um, and I think that's a very valuable lesson. Um, so, but when when you came to Central Bistro, it sounds like you you got a little bit of that confidence back, knowing that you didn't necessarily need secret sauce to be successful. That you could do it. That you they did teach you something. Yeah, I, I learned. I learned. It, it was it was awesome for me every day to take the lessons that I'd learned from Josh and Secret Sauce to my line cooks at, at Central Bistro and my management and the ownership even. Give me three lessons or two lessons. If it means something to you, if it's important to you, whether it's how you edit an email, how you interact with a customer, how you interact with, if it means something to you. You take care of business. The other part is hospitality is so much more than what happens in these four walls. Hospitality is outside of, of, of these four walls. Mm. It's it's it's. We, we we always talked about like giving back and and how important that is. And from, I gotta say that resonates so much more with with me. Again, you know, poor kid, no expectations. All of a sudden, you got these things, and you you you, it, you have to give back. You have to. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm loving the conversation. Uh, anything else we haven't discussed up to this point? Um, I mean, any spe- specialized knowledge you want to share with us? Anything you can, you know that you can share with us that will make us better after listening to you? Hey, this nothing I can freestyle, man. Hey, nothing I can say to make anybody better. I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, I mean, just knowledge you can share, lessons you've learned, things that you wish you knew when you're getting into this industry that you know for certain now. Be yourself. You have to be yourself. Um, and you have to be strong enough to be yourself. You have to be strong enough to point out what's wrong and what's right. And when we go back to, like, wasting resources and souls, again, I don't have the master plan on how to fix all that, but being str- and being strong enough to point it out, and that's been the biggest difference, I think, between then and now, this this second chapter of my career. I feel like I'm stronger now. I'm so weak every morning and, and on my way home and... But when I'm in my rhythm and when I'm in my zone and when I know who I am professionally, you call it out and you take care of business. Yeah. I mean, I think you're going someplace that's really important right now. And it's um, kind of this uh, school of thought, right? I think a lot when we're growing up, we're told that, like, you got to work on your weaknesses. you got to be well-rounded. And, I mean, there's some truth to that. <laughs> but I also think there's some truth to knowing who you are, knowing what your strengths are, and putting yourself in a position to – to maximize your strengths. Into- Second half of my career, I'm learning how to embrace my OCD. Okay. How do and you do that? Organize. Okay. Organize. 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 Organize people. Organize stations. Organize 
Like I've never been a numbers and inventory person, but that's become like my bread and butter is is creating and teaching inventory systems to dummies because I'm a dummy. <laughs> I'm horrible with numbers. I'm dyslexic as hell. Dude, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir now. Dyslexic, horrible numbers right there with you. So how would you teach? What, what's one lesson? Give me, I mean, it's hard without the actual numbers right here in front of us and the systems in front of us, but give us a lesson on inventory. Give us something that most people aren't doing that you teach people to do. Make your inventory sheets cut and dry, easy to read so that anybody can do it. Because certainly you should be there teaching and, 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 and walking inventories day, inventory days with your staff. But occasionally, man, there's going to be that day that somebody's got to do it for you and they're looking at this sheet that don't make no sense with a bunch of numbers and lines and graphs that are fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just one part of it. The other part of it is, is, is like how do, you, how do you incorporate waste into your inventory mm -hmm. systems and then therefore learn from it? And how do you teach n people that may not have the experience, how do you teach them to look at a category of inventory and say, this is where I'm spending my money. I'm going to track it for a little bit, a little while here, and I'm going to learn from it, and I'm going to do something about it. That, that's, that's, that's where I'm at with building inventory systems and in selling that and, and passing that along. It's not just about the numbers. It's how do you react? Yes. And are you reacting for the right ways? Are you being proactive are you being reactive i mean you know when you open a restaurant you, you, there's a, you have to be reactive to a degree but the more reactive and the more you're paying attention to it the more you're going to become proactive and it's just digging down and taking care of business so how do we get to that point ultimately how do we get to that point of proactivity and not reactivity well that's where that's where things get really blurred and really <laughs> fucked up because to be proactive you cannot create balance in your life. You have to put in the hours. You have to stick around. You know, you, you have to get your ass kicked on a double shift for the first two weeks and then sit down and go through inventory. Would You can't see straight. Your body's falling apart. Everybody wants a bit, bit of your time. Um, but And that's just not not just our business. I'm sure it's your business to get to where you, you, you are. You, you've had no, to put I'm, in the late nights. I'm usually the pain in the ass looking for people's time. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like you, you put in the yeah, late hours yeah. and, and you and you'll find balance at some point. Well, I mean, what I'm hearing from you is you just got to get out there and experience it. You don't know what you don't know until you know. And the only way to know is to, to, dump, to jump in, right? You jump in, you assess, and then you jump out. And you go, what was that like? And then you do it the next time, but with a different foundation and, and, or a different, a whole new experience. One thing I, I've learned about you in different, I, I've, seen you see, I've seen you say it a few different times in different articles, is that every time you... You get back in. There's a new series of things that you never knew. There's a new series of lessons that are uh, different variables that you never had even considered that are just constantly coming at you. So it's never ending. You know, mm -hmm. if you're growing, if you're pushing yourself, you're going to be failing often. You know, you're going to be learning things, new things all the time. It's a never ending process, right? But the more you do it, the more you can start to recognize. Okay, I've been here before. I remember what happened, and now I can be proactive to to get ahead of whatever the situation is. Or I don't want to put words into your mouth. But. No, that, that's absolutely right. Or be thinking about the, the, the variables that you have no control over. Yeah. At least you're thinking about them. And it's, 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 you know, it's the same thing of like multitasking through a giant prep day. Yeah. Um, like what can go wrong? Yeah. You know, uh, so, something I want to talk to you about, I think we're kind of cut from the same cloth uh, in the sense that um, – I'm, I tend to be more of a, an emotionally, socially intelligent person. I'm feeling like you, you kind of lean on emotions and uh, your leadership abilities and stuff like that, too. And um, you mentioned you're dyslexic. I'm dyslexic. I tend to do better in chaotic situations. I tend to thrive in chaos um, where some people tend, like if you look at the yin and the yang, like chaos and order. Yeah. Um, and neither one of those things is necessarily right or wrong. Typically, there's a, a balance in between the two that's a sweet spot. But I think that if you're inclined to be a chaotic person, if you thrive if you live in chaos and you do well in chaos um then you should embrace that instead of trying Absolutely. to change yourself uh if you if you if you live in order then you should embrace that and put yourself into situations where you will thrive where, where on the spectrum would you say you are realizing how chaotic and and, and self-destructive i am but also striving to turn that into order yeah uh, I, I set up rules for myself. Have uh, you learned to embrace your chaos on any, at any point? That's all things, I can do. Are you doing things now to, to, to I guess, 
not have to try not to be chaotic, but to continue to be chaotic, but to live in a way that your chaos is embraced. It's, 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 it's every day. So how are you doing that? Well, back to like being OCD, like how yeah. do I, how do I turn that into being a more organized chef, cook, restaurateur, whatever, yeah. you know, and how do I teach that to a young cook? Um, my, my self-destructive nature is like, I, I'm using that to, to, I pay attention to myself a hell lot more yeah. and I pay attention to others and, 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 and look for signs that they might be needing some help and that they might be struggling. Mm. Um, I, 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 I just take chapters from my life and, 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 and I, I look at how they've helped me back or they've helped me. And I, and I, I, I don't know it's a daily thing. So there's one more thing, and this is another thing that um, resonated with me that I want to pull into the, today's conversation. Um, this is a, a quote from 303 Magazine. Uh, you said that you're going from aggressively trying to kill chains to actively trying to produce better versions. Um, and I think when I first started this podcast, I was very anti-chain, very anti-corporation, very, you know, we, we need more independent mm-hmm. operations successful in the world. Um, the more I learn, the more I realize that not all chains – not all corporations are evil, right? Um, and I think there's, there's, it's kind of a not one way or the other, but we kind of like chaos and order. We need to meet in the middle. Somewhere. Absolutely. Um, so, what are your thoughts on, you know, how are you trying to actively uh, produce better versions of chains? Like, what, what, what were you communicating in that statement? <laughs> uh, l- listen, if if if, if so. It, it, if, if 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 I had like three culinary director offers in front of me, like like position offers in front of me, it would come down to who's the coolest, who's doing it right, and who's paying attention. What's doing it right look like? Paying attention to resources, paying attention to community, um, not not trying to make a fast buck, not trying to take advantage of people, not trying to take advantage of communities, and not trying to take advantage of current trends, like. Who's in it for the long haul? What's wrong with taking advantage of trends? Do it in the right way. Um, I'm not disagreeing with you, by the way. I'm just, I have opinions, but it's not my time to share my opinions. <laughs> I'm like, time. no, you tell me. Like, <laughs> now, now you got me thinking about what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, yes, there, there, there's, 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 a, there's a, a grown-up maturation that comes along with saying, listen, there ain't, there ain't no more evil empires. If, and if somebody comes to Colorado with big business, they're employing people. Yeah. Um, that's important to me. And I don't mind sharing why I don't like people who chase trends, if you want me to share. No, I'm please do. do I'd love to hear. Because trends come and go. And yeah. anybody who's, who's chasing a trend is also chasing money. Because you can't chase one without the other. Because the only reason why you're chasing a trend in the first place is because it's something right now but the thing is if you were to design a whole concept around a trend by the time you get capital by the time you find a team it's by gone. the time you, the trend's gone it's gone right you know and uh, trends i don't know I'm, I, instead of chasing the trend you should cha- you should be the trend you should you should create the trend and then you'll yes. own that trend you know be, well, well, or or not even focus on trends i mean focus is, on whatever it, you do yeah. and that will turn into a trend and the, the the people who create trends aren't trying to create trends. They're doing whatever it was, the crazy idea, the the, the cronut, right? You know, right. you think they were chasing a trend when they developed? No, no they, like, they made a mistake or they got creative and it. Let's took have off. some fun. Yeah, let's have some fun. Exactly. And 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 I take that back to like big business. Like if 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 your goal is to make money, go for it. Yeah. But do it right. Mm-hmm. Conscious capitalism. Yeah. I hear you. So I can't believe we're already over two hour of two hours of recording. Has it really, been two hours? No, one hour. Sorry, one hour it's and like, two minutes. That's okay. what it was. Um, anything we have not discussed in this part of our conversation, the free flowing portion of the conversation that you want to get out, anything that you're hoping we would discuss today that has not come to surface, now's the time. No, <laughs> you've been awesome, man. I love this. Something I'm asking all my guests. Uh, the, the mission statement of the podcast is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. So who are you today? Who are the man you are today versus the man you were in 1995 uh, getting into the industry? How have you transformed? It, it, this is where I kind of get emotional because it's a very recent transformation. I spoke about, you know, my, like my sexuality and, and, and more importantly, you know, I've been, I've been married in this business and I've raised kids in this business.
the, the, the person that I am now is so ignorant, ignorantly awoke and just trying to figure it out and, and just trying to be a better person all around yeah. with, with how I go about this business and, and how I go about my personal life and, and realizing that there, there should be some balance, but there ain't. It ain't going to happen. So now's a good time to just accept that and be better. Yeah. And I, I feel like we always think it's going to be there's we in our minds we we imagine that it's going to get better. Or like I'll just get over this hump and then it'll be you know It ain't. And you know the truth of the matter is like life's fucking hard. Yeah. It's a bitch, you know, and you can choose to focus on the the hard stuff, the the bitchy stuff or you can focus on what you do have. Right? Yeah. You can you can focus on being grateful for what you have accomplished for the people you you, you know Focus Ironic, on the good. Ironically, like in the first part of my career, you know, chapter one, when things were handed to me, I would have those conversations with myself, like whether it was something in the business or something in my, my personal life. And I, I have to say right now, as I'm, like my, my biggest support system is, is my ex-wife and, and our daughters and, yeah. and how we've made it through these transitions in the business and our personal lives together. But even back then, you throw a family into it. Like, when am I going to get over this hump? Whether it's financial or something personal going on in our lives. And, you know, like, how, when's it going to get better? And here I am on the other side of it. And I'd like to think that my family feels the same way. Being more honest and clear with ourselves, we're not so hung up with. Yeah. When's it going to get better as yeah. much as here we are? Yeah, you know, and I, I, I feel like we have this tendency as humans to kind of build up this this hurdle like whatever it is whatever your challenge is whatever you're embarrassed by or whatever insecurity you have in our mind it's this massive monster right and it's scary and it's, it's our fear and we put it off forever forever and ever and then we finally say something we finally yeah you know and then we're like that was it that was it that was that, that was, was that, it that's what was like, holding me yeah, back from all this exactly man. how many years was this eating you up i mean i, I didn't Everything happened so fast in my career. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that whatever it is that you think is the worst thing in your mind, whatever is tearing you up, whatever you think that everybody is just going to disown you once they find out, in the reality, nobody gives a fuck. No, nobody gives a fuck. Let it go. You're the only person that cares. Let it go. You let it go and just accept who you are. Once you, you, nobody will accept you fully until you accept yourself, right? No. All right. Awesome stuff. And I've loved this conversation. All right, we're back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Kindness. Kindness. What is your biggest weakness? Kindness to a fault. Yeah, you know, it comes up all the time that our strengths are our weaknesses, right? Uh, how, do you, how do you find that balance? How do you work being str strong but knowing that it's your weakness it's easy to do as a consultant yeah um it's not so easy to do when you're a general manager a executive chef culinary director whatever you know again you you have to am i going is this too many words to this no, answer you're good, you're good, you're good. um you, you know you again as a consultant i can say and be direct and and to the point like this is not right yeah you might have to nurture a little bit more on the other side got you uh what is one question you ask or thing you look for when you're building a team, maybe back in your, your days when you were hiring, what were you looking for? What questions were you asking? Motivation. How do you know if somebody's motivated? You see it. You see it in their eyes. Mm. You see it in their actions. What is your biggest challenge today? Getting out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> How are you overcoming that challenge? Got a job to do. I, and I, and I've, I've, got, I've got kids to feed and friends to make and, and, and a life to leave. Uh, yep. Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your, your team. This is a way to be, a way to act, a core value. Professional. You have to be professional because but being professional, whether it's in the industry, it, it encompasses all. Kindness, all of those things. To me, it does. Directness. Be professional. What is one uncommon standard of service you've taught your team in the past? Pay attention. Watch where their eyes are going. What do you mean? Are they looking outside because something's bothering them? Are they because it's not warm enough? Are they chilly? Like so back to the body language. Pay be, attention. Be proactive. Be ahead of it. Don't yeah. wait for them to ask. It, be empathetic. You, the things that they're going through with their body language are things that you damn well know 
So do something about it. Yeah, awesome stuff. What is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant owner or operator? A tree Grows in Brooklyn. <laughs> what, what's the book? A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Tree Grows in Book a tree. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. I don't. Are you saying three or tree? A tree. a tree. A tree grows in Brooklyn. A tree grows Sorry, in Brooklyn. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, no, no, no. You're good. You're good. I mean, classic literature. Um, here, you know, Victorian time. Here's here's a girl, a little 10, 12 year old girl that went through a hell of a lot more than I have in those Victorian times and in Brooklyn. Um, what did they teach you? I ain't going to complain anymore. If this little girl can like live and 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 like. Again, like think of Brooklyn, Victorian times. Yeah. Narcissistic, chauvinistic, full of isms, and your little girl growing up, and your dad's an alcoholic, and your mom's like just trying to get by. My life is pretty fucking good. I, know, I, think, <laughs> I think it comes back to relativity, right? We get so caught up in our own little yeah. bubble, our own world, mm -hmm. that we forget to realize what we have and how much worse it could be. Yeah. Right? And the focusing on the good is just such. A game changer. It really and, and and even even that book, how it applies to the industry. Just be cool, be empathetic, and be kind. Pay attention to the signs. Those are the people that make money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is one thing you feel restaurateurs don't do well enough or often enough? Pay attention. Yep. Uh, what is one piece of technology you've adopted or you're suggesting your uh, clients adopt to make their business more? functional, more uh, efficient, more profitable, more or improved communication, anything along those lines? Online ordering. Okay. What do you recommend for a service? Like, like I love DoorDash. Okay. My, my problem with all of it is is the ability to, to cherry pick. As, 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 as a restaurateur, as a brand, as an owner, you, it's tough to protect who you are, it's, and it's tough to protect your brand when DoorDash delivers your food half an hour late and the greens are slimy. You know, yeah. they, they hold you responsible, not DoorDash. Yeah. Um, but but I think that in terms of, like, increasing sales, especially in Colorado with marijuana being legal, yeah. like, yeah, these things are awesome. But it's tough to protect yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, you brought up the whole marijuana. You were one of my last interviews in Colorado, and I've been thinking about asking – um, some of the restaurateurs, what their thoughts are on, on marijuana. What do you, you think? It's a good thing or a bad I, thing? It's, it's it, well. I mean, you, you got to have a policy. You know, yeah. you, you can't have employees. I was about to say showing up stoned every day, but I, I, I know that it's a part of my life, and that's the yeah. way that I'll, I'll say that. You know, how much and when I do it is up to me, and I, I take care of it pro professionally. I also think that whether it's in the restaurant business or larger scale, somebody's got to do the right thing and embrace marijuana as part of their, you know, like, no, we are not going to drug test. We're going to be big business and we are not going to drug test for marijuana. And we're going to say that publicly because we, we, we understand that that is vital. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I will say that marijuana to me is vital. Why is it vital? I'm curious. I, I need to calm down. Yeah, you know the reason why I'm and, so I'm, curious, and I'm in tons of pain. <laughs> the, re the reason why I'm so curious, honestly, and um, I kind of I published an episode earlier this week, or lot maybe when this is live will be two weeks ago, um, where I basically just got open and honest, and, and I admitted that I want to start sharing more about myself. And the truth is, I love smoking weed. I, uh -huh. I, like I'm afraid of even calling myself a stoner. You know what I mean? Like I enjoy it um, more than a drink. You know? Yeah. Uh, to to be able to digest my thoughts, to be able to get close to myself and to be able to just slow down and yeah. figure out like where am I going like what matters most to me and, and when I'm trying to figure myself out which I was recently going through just trying to figure out what direction I want to take restaurant unstoppable over the past couple of weeks after some changes like I got really stoned really often to kind of just be <laughs> present you know but I'm also kind of ashamed at times and embarrassed be. to admit Why? but that's the that's the fucking question why um, get but, out of that get out of that but sometimes I feel like people um, won't be taken or they're afraid they won't be taken as serious um, if, sure. if it comes no, up, and, 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 oh, just a, you know, what's up with that? You're growing a business. You're growing a brand. And, yeah. and, and I don't want to give you, like, I'm not going to sit here. Oh, dude. You, no, th those are important things to remember. I think it might be a little different for me. Like, whatever. You hire yeah. me or not. This I, is who I am. I, I, I got East Coast culture, too, you know. So that's Absolutely. another thing. So. I mean, you know, Colorado, we've always been stoners yeah. we, we, before it came legal and i wasn't a stoner b before it was legal i got into it yeah trying to just get my head straight and more importantly get out of pain um and and yeah you know i don't know that my grandma knows that i smoke 
Um, and I, I'd love to tell her. So I get it. Mm. But on the other hand, like, it, it's 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 not about, oh, I'm so stoned and high. It's, 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 well, it's controlled use. And I think that's the big conversation yeah. that needs to happen is what does controlled use look like? I mean, is there just getting blitzed off your ass every day? Or is it taking a little hit to calm your nerves and to Ooh. get in a place of flow and a place of, of for me, like I just ideas and creativity just comes to me so much more fluidly. Yeah. So that's why I like. It. Being said, I think that there's a lot to be. There's especially in Colorado. I feel like Colorado's at the perfect time and place to say, hey, maybe booze. Like like, <laughs> let, let, let's stop giving away shift drinks. Maybe let's start giving out shift joints. Like. <laughs> It's so much healthier and, 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 and so much more productive. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that whether, again, like whether it's the restaurant industry or, or other, whatever, like marijuana is so much safer mm-hmm. and so much, and, and so much more interesting and so much more exciting and fun. I feel like it turns your brain on where, say, alcohol kind of shuts it off. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, and, and, and they have their yeah. they have their purposes, yeah. you know, well, I mean, this is a different conversation for a different day. But uh, <laughs> it was, this is the first actually the first time I've actually been open and, and public. Good about, for you. Yeah, Congratulations. So you inspired that, you know, because you came out and you were open and honest and you, you're going through some stuff that's hard for you to admit. And I figured out to reciprocate. So thank you for going there first. My I pleasure, man. It. All right. So this is the last question. Okay. Actually, it's not the last question. I skipped one. I apologize. Uh, the, la- the second to last question is, what is one piece of technology you've adopted within the four walls or you're coaching people to adopt within the four? Wait, I just asked that. That, was, that so, was. Should I edit that out or just, or do you have another one? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to embrace. Um, I got a little worked up with my coming out of being a, a, a marijuana. <laughs> now, so you're, you're out. Like out, everybody. I can't go back. He's, he's Eric Stoner. <laughs> and congratulations. <laughs> so what were you going to say? I cut you off. Handheld technology. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's important. It's vital. Um, but there's also an element of, is that person actually taking care of business or are they, you know what I mean? Like, mm. is, um, I, and I don't, again, I don't, I, I don't know if it is important or vital, but handheld technology. You're talking like POS, like ordering, table side ordering, or are you talking? Ordering well, well did that and cell phones. Gotcha. I mean, yeah. you know. The I, tools that our phone can provide. Yeah, because somebody looking at their, their schedule on their cell phone. is work, technically, but are they texting? I right. Know. Yeah. That's so that, how, that. how does that all work out? I think what's happening right now is that this is supposed to be a speed around. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's happening right now is that the, the world is changing so fast, and culture doesn't change as fast as the world is changing. And we haven't, we haven't developed etiquette, like etiquette around use of technology. No, and, yeah, and no. Like we just it, we haven't needed to, and I think it's something that does need to happen. Like a, a like you know uh, etiquette and cultural standards need to develop. Well, and I think I think the conversations are starting to happen. I think you know we're the first generation, so we haven't had somebody to teach us to not do it right, or we haven't had somebody exactly. Like, you know, we need to start like t- talking to our kids. Like, hey, if you're having a conversation with somebody. Put your phone away. You Make know, eye that's, contact. That's like opening a door. It's just respectful, you know? Well, but, but I think that you could say the same about any sort of advance or introduction to the industry. Yeah, it's cool. Pay attention. Pay yeah. attention to how it affects people, and, and, and it's not just the bottom line. Yeah. Okay, now this is the last question. Okay. <laughs> if you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you can leave behind uh, for the good of humanity and for your legacy. The three things you would want to tie your legacy to, what would they be? It all goes back to giving back as much as you can and just being kind. That's one. Wait, 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 wait. There's three. Okay, so it's giving back. That's one. Being kind. That's two. Work. Work. I love work, it, man. work, work, work hard. Matt, I've loved this <laughs> conversation, dude. You were a great person to talk to. Thank uh, you. I appreciate you getting. I've, I've enjoyed this. Like, I, yeah, I feel like we fun. should go off the air and talk more about what you do. I'm jealous. Absolutely, man. I mean, there's a bar 20 <laughs> feet that way. Let's let's make it happen. Uh, let the folks at, know, at home know how can we connect with you if we want to maybe chew on your ear, ask you some questions. Use, use I, your I think services. you should come in and, and find me here at West of Surrender, okay. where you know these guys are my my current clients, and I love what they're doing here on the 16th Street Mall. They've got the old Marlowe space. What's the address for those? Or where, where are we? A 501. 16th Street 
80202. Oh, my God, I remember that. I don't have the <laughs> telephone number, but the name of the restaurant is West of Surrender. And these guys have been nothing but incredible clients. I'll tell you why. They're themselves. They, yeah. they, they do it their way. They work hard. And as this restaurant has grown and developed, and I've got to know the owners and the management team, they've done what they said and they do what they're going to do. I can't say enough about them. Yep. I, I respect them so much. They work so hard. Well, I'm about to belly up and yeah, man. <laughs> so uh, I can't wait to experience it. And uh, what about an email? Can you drop an email? Um, selbymat5, that's the number five, at gmail.com. And that's Selby, S E L B Y, the number five at gmail.com. Selby Matt five. Selby Matt five at gmail.com. I'll give my number if you want. I mean, if people want to give me, a, want to talk to me about Go a culinary director role or. Yeah, yeah. 720 <laughs> 387 5311. There we Call go. Call me anytime. Awesome, <laughs> man. I love it. And um, we, we also end every episode by calling somebody out. That's one thing we haven't done yet. That's how I found you. So, who do you respect and admire in this industry? I believe it would make a great guest mentor. Like I, I would love for you to have Josh Walcon on, but I know that he's out of town and, and, and doing his thing. Paul Riley. Paul I Riley. love. Have you have you heard of him? Have you spoken with I him yet? I have not. Paul Riley, Beast and Bottle. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Coperta. Like, he's... he's, he's Paul, he, Josh. I'm looking. Look out, guys. I'm coming after you. Right? I'd love to get you. Did Find him. Did I cut you short? Were you going to add something on that? Just, just Paul Riley. I mean, he, he's one of the guys that's on that cusp of... Yeah. He's already big as far as I'm concerned, but... He's trying to learn. He, he's figuring out how to be big, while creating that balance with life and, and 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 resources. I love it, man. This has been a great conversation. Again, just thank you so much for taking the time to to share your knowledge, to share your story, and to to open up, and to to be just your real genuine self today. I My pleasure, can't man. Say thank you. Enough. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm I'm, I'm thrilled <laughs> that you would have me. Like I I like. We were talking earlier about Drew Naporant and all the people that you've had on your show, man. Little old me, awesome. You Thank know you. what, man? But here's the thing that I've learned that um, media and publicity is kind of a lot of bullshit. And yeah. I want to talk to the people that other people who are successful respect and admire. And that's where the magic is. And that's why you're here because you have the respect and uh, just appreciation from your city. And I couldn't have been more lucky to, to share your story and your knowledge, man. You're great. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>